Hello, hello, have a seat. Come on in. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so hyped about today's show because the Kings are taking on the Warriors tomorrow for game three in the playoffs with a 2-0 and lead in the series. And this is not only a historic time for the team, but for the city as well, as the national spotlight is all shining on this amazing team. And earlier today, Demonte Sabonis was at practice for the first time since the Warriors. Draymond Green stomped on his chest. Coach Mike Brown says that it is likely Sabonis will play tomorrow. According to the Kings, an x-ray showed Sabonis suffered from a bruise on his sternum. And now, if you aren't going to San Francisco for the game, you might be going to the watch party at Golden One Center tomorrow. And if you are looking for tickets to watch the to go to the watch party, don't because they're already sold out. They've been sold out. But if you do want to try and get a ticket to that watch party for game four, free tickets will be available starting on April 21st, which is just this Friday. It's right around the corner. Make sure that you set an alarm on your phone. And tonight we are celebrating because the NBA named Sacramento Kings head coach Mike Brown coach of the year and this is historic because this is the first unanimous coach of the year award winner this is actually the second time coach brown has won the nba coach of the year award the last time was actually back in 2009 and we want to hear from you what changes has coach brown brought to the kings you can scan that qr code let me know what you think and we'll have your responses coming up a little bit later in the show and did we also mention that De'Aaron fox won the inaugural clutch player of the year award yeah, we have a lot to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, you can see his family super happy there. And Sir Clutch has officially lived up to his nickname. This award goes to the player who shines in the last five minutes of close games. And Fox led the whole league in clutch points this year. Very exciting. And if you have been a Kings fan for quite some time, then you probably recognize this voice. Boy, I noticed one of my, uh, I was reading a blog the other day, and the Kings uh, fans, they, they got a game that if I mention certain words, they take a drink as a group. <laughs> yep, that's Jerry Reynolds. He was the King, he was with the Kings franchise for a long time. I mean, so much so that his name is on the Golden One Center building. And a lot of my colleagues, they were so excited that I was interviewing him. And I have to say that he is exactly what everyone described him to be. He was warm, he was funny, and he was definitely humble. You served as head coach, general manager, director of player personnel, and then as longtime commentator on King's broadcast. You've been a part of the fabric of this organization for over 30 years. I mean, your name is literally on the side of the building here at Golden One. So how are you feeling right now seeing the Kings in the playoffs? It's been just a joy as a fan, which I am now, to see them back and know they're a good young team now and gonna be good for a long time. Uh, it's thrilling, you know, I'm a kid again. So I want to go back to April 13th, 2011, because you were commentating on the Kings versus Lakers game. We know that the Sacramento Kings lost to the Lakers in that game, but that was also a night that many people thought would be the Kings last game in Sacramento. So talk to me about what that day was like. Well, thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to make it off the air. We felt it'd be our last game, the Kings last game. And so it was pretty, pretty sad, you know, obviously I, I, I just thought it'd really be unfair to the fans, all the support they'd given for the years. Really uh, tough times, you know, it's one of those things people said, because they'd always ask me, well, if the team moved to Anaheim, would you go with them? I said, no, I don't care about Anaheim. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay here regardless. And now here we are all these years later, and it wasn't the last Kings game. It wasn't the last King games, and you know, we're here in front of Golden One. Uh, Beautiful new downtown arena, uh, been revitalized, left the old Arco, which had a lot of great memories as well, but now new memories here, and that's, it, it's uh, about time, I think. What's it like seeing your name on the side of the building? I mean, you were cemented into history here at the Golden One Center. Oh, no, it doesn't fit, really. I, I mean, you know, it's the first time I've actually been down here in front of this. It's nice. It's very respectful. It's nice. but Is it great to see, though, that you are a part of history? Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm very proud to have, have served my time, you know, and I, like I say, had every job. TV career was a blast. That was probably the most fun, to be truthful. You can't lose a game if you're broadcasting. <laughs> so so I don't, I could be, get home and I would be in a good mood. <laughs> it wasn't as stressful. As stressful, no. <laughs> You've been around Kings basketball for a very long time. What is it about Kings fans that make them so special? You know, their, their loyalty, uh, just enthusiasm, I mean, and knowledge. I, I've always said, I think, 
my experience with the Kings fans is some of the times the, the losing uh, teams uh, really made them appreciate good basketball more and made them study more. You know, they know the league. Is this a new era of the Kings? I do think. I do think. You know, and I, I'm so happy because I was getting to the point, honestly, I'm 79, so I was getting to the point. I, I want to see a playoff team before it was over, <laughs> you know, and so, so I'm really thrilled about that. It's like, yeah, okay, we, I, might, I might be able to hang around a little while longer. What does this kind of playoff exposure mean for a city like Sacramento? Well, it's tremendous because I think the, the nation is, is getting to see, you know, what we've known here a long time, the great fan support. Uh, just the, the joy that this team brings to this community and how good they are. You know, they've been good all year, but really you were kind of pushed aside, I think, in, in the national media viewpoint. But uh, now it's like you can't, you can't deny what you see. And tomorrow we will have the second part of my interview with Jerry Reynolds, where we discuss everything from Coach Brown to his message to the Kings players as they head into Game 3. All right, coming up after the break, a big part of the Kings legacy is when we almost lost them after the break, how the city fought and won to keep the beam team. Repeat after me. We, we did it. Yeah. It was May. 2013, then Sacramento Mayor Kevin Johnson was taking a victory lap at City Hall, making it official after the NBA Board of Governors in Dallas decided the Kings could not move to Seattle, killing a deal made by the former owners. I want to go ahead and break in Luke Clear. You're live in the studio tonight. Mm -hmm. Luke, very good to see you. Um, this is something that a lot of newer Kings fans may not know. I mean, we almost didn't even go to the playoffs because we didn't almost have a team. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I mean, from the mid-2000s until that very moment that you saw there, uh, the Kings were in real danger of being relocated to another city. I, I know that there was interest on the East Coast in Anaheim, as we heard from Jerry Reynolds, a great interview, by oh, the way. You, thank you, and, He's such, uh, such a sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a sweet guy. And then uh, at, the, at the end there, um, a deal was very close to being struck with uh, an ownership group in Seattle. So the former mayor, Kevin Johnson, who you saw there, he was an NBA star, and he really helped spearhead this grassroots effort to save the Kings, keep them here in Sacramento. And the NBA Board of Governors killed the deal between the uh, Maloof family who previously owned the Kings and that Seattle-based buyer. And in just 48 hours, it went to a new group headed by the current owner, Vivek Ranadive. And I do want to mention, too, before we go, that part of that deal was getting a new arena. That's why we have beautiful downtown in Doko and Golden One Arena, right? Yeah, exactly right. It was about a half a billion dollar project. They broke ground in 2014 and opened in time for the uh, 2016 season. Constructors promised an arena that uh, would be the envy of all other NBA teams <laughs> in the country. And you may recall uh, the 700 block of K Street at that time was pretty much vacant, uh, very run down. And so the investment there now has brought a lot of jobs oh, yeah. and, well, life to the Golden One yeah. Center, Doco, the entire arena yeah. where we've spent a lot of time in yeah. the last several days. And it's so great to see everyone down mm -hmm. there. So it's really been just amazing to see that arena. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Luke, we appreciate Thanks. it. All right, after the break, we will have your talking points and we're also sharing a story about families who have lost loved ones because of fentanyl. They are calling on state lawmakers to step up their response to this crisis. So it's been an emotional week at the Capitol as families of fentanyl victims gathered to urge lawmakers to take this crisis seriously. Political reporter Morgan Reiner found out that they are unhappy that the chair of the Assembly Public Safety Committee decided that he would hold off on hearing all fentanyl related bills. He says that he's afraid that if the bills proceed as normal, none of them would pass. Assemblymember Jim Patterson asked Pamela Smith to testify in front of the Public Safety Committee a few weeks ago to share her son's story. I met with the ER doctor who simply told me we've been working on him for over an hour and there's nothing more we can do. And he asked me if I would like to see my son. Jackson Smith overdosed. Within seconds of entering that room, 
the doctor said, time of death, 318. Since Jackson's death, I have made it my mission to fight this fentanyl crisis. But Pamela didn't get to testify. For the public safety chair to say now, oh, well, I'm going to wait till September and have some conversation about it. I'm sorry, you're taking too long. We have good ideas. They have been discussed, but you won't even vet them. Committee Chair Assemblyman Reginald John Sawyer wants everyone to know this issue is personal to him too. I had an uncle who died of a heroin overdose. I have a had a cousin who died of crack cocaine. I know what the effects of drug abuse has. He said he hopes to hold a hearing in June. I was very concerned that a lot of the bills that were coming through weren't making through. They, they were they were dying in our committee. Um, I decided I need to save the remaining bills so that we can have a, an educated discussion on both the demand side and the supply side. Whether the bills are heard in June or tomorrow, they still wouldn't go into effect until at least January if they pass. But Republicans point out that they, along with some Democrats, have been introducing bills to address the fentanyl crisis for years. And here are some other stories that people are talking about today. Let the race for Sacramento mayor begin today. Flo Jean Kofor announced that she's throwing her hat in the ring. She's a public health expert, senior policy director, and former chair of the city's Measure U Community Advisory Committee. And Kofor says that she is offering a progressive choice to voters and that there are groups from whom she will not accept campaign contributions from. Uh, the groups I won't take money from are corporate PACs, law enforcement, fossil fuels, tobacco, because they killed my family members. And then when it comes to real estate and landlords and developers, I will only take money if they support affordable housing, if they support tenant protections, and anti-displacement initiatives. And Kofor is the first candidate to officially declare that she's running for mayor of Sacramento. Next year's primary election is in March. And current Sacramento mayor, Daryl Steinberg, has told ABC 10 in the past that he will not seek a third term. Of course, we reached out to his office today for comment and asked if he plans on running. A spokesperson said they have no announcement at this time. And the family of Sacramento native Tyree Nichols filed a civil lawsuit against the city of Memphis, their police department, and the officers involved in his death. The 29-year-old father was beaten by Memphis police earlier this year and died just a short time later. And the five officers involved were fired from the department and face a number of criminal charges, including second-degree murder. And we had historic days of winter, what felt like endless amounts of snow and rain. But now we're taking a look at if California is wasting water opportunities, if they're wasting any chances to save all this water. And the ABC 10 team has really been looking into this question in their next upcoming series called Water Wasted. So tonight, meteorologist Carly Gomez takes a look at the power of water right under our feet. After three years of record drought in California, the floodgates have opened. Record snowpack has hit the Sierra, a prime time to capture that extra water. But we have to be able to hold some of that water back or store it um, so that we can release it at a rate where it can soak into the ground. Third generation farmer Daniel Bays knows the importance of water stored underground. Down there, there might be enough water for a a domestic well for a house, but if you were gonna try and farm with it, the amount of water you get out of there would be such a minimal amount. That's because after years of drought, over pumping this water has left our largest natural reservoir parched. And now restoring groundwater is the state's biggest focus. Lake Shasta is the biggest reservoir we have in the state. Well, above ground in the reservoir systems we have in California, we have the equivalent of nine Lake Shastas. Below the ground, we have the equivalent of 30 Lake Shastas. Being able to map out the best areas to store that water has been Stanford geophysicist Rosemary Knight's life's work. After years of airborne and ground surveys, we're getting a better understanding of the roadmap to water storage. So if we can connect our engineered infrastructure to our natural infrastructure and think about managing our water that way and getting water back into our groundwater systems, 
That's when I look at these data and go, wow, what an opportunity. But until we can come up with a plan and pass bills, a big portion of California's water will run out to sea. We're going to be expecting more intense droughts, more intense floods, and a quicker transition from one to the next. So this managed groundwater recharge is, is really important. And joining me now is meteorologist Carly Gomez. And Carly, this is really just a preview of a larger piece that you and the weather team have been working on, really analyzing the water here in our own state, right? That's right. And, you know, with all this excess water, it's going into the snow package, dropping into the reservoirs, downstreams, rivers. Everyone's asking, well, where is this all going? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much going out to see if it's not being stored. I mean, we've had so much. The excess here has to go somewhere. The reservoirs can't hold anymore, but are we doing enough to actually save this water and put it in motion? Well, the truth is there has been something in motion for almost 10 years ago, and it's called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but that's just what it does. It manages and it records how much water is underground and whether someone is over pumping and overusing, but they're not necessarily building up that water with a long-term plan. But with the incredible year that we've seen, is that going to become a priority? Well, we hope so. And that's the biggest thing with this is the Department of Water Resources, they're coming together to figure out how they can continue to store the water. But of course, these things take time. It yeah. takes a lot yeah. of time, red tape. There's water rights, grandfathered in water rights. I mean, there's so much that goes into this. The plans even go as late as 2030 to 2040. And there are proposals. So they're not even necessarily implemented as a we must do this now mm -hmm. it's kind of like maybe we should do this we'll look into it more we still have all this red tape and that's what people like farmer daniel bays there is saying that it's going through a lot of litigation that's one of those things it's like we need to do a vact already already yeah and groundwater i mean is really important like you said to future proof against climate change but Another thing that the state is proposing to help with climate change is the Delta Tunnel, right? That's right. And it's one of those big controversial issues that we've been dealing with because that specific zone, they push water through to help ecological Delta smelt. It's a fish out there that they've been trying to save, but people mm -hmm. are saying we haven't seen very many of those. It's a huge controversial issue. Of course, Brendan, meteorologist Brendan Menchaf, he's going to be discussing all of this with you tomorrow. All right, Carly, thank you so much. And also don't forget tomorrow on April 20th, all ABC News programs and platforms will be featuring content about the issues surrounding water. You can catch the power of water on all ABC News platforms this Thursday. We're back with your King's comments right after this. All right, it's my favorite part of the night because I get to read your comments. And we have been asking about your thoughts on Kings coach Mike Brown getting NBA coach of the year. So let's read some of your comments. We had one viewer write in saying that Mike Brown changed the Kings by encouragement, disciplined practice, team fundamentals to create open shots and reduce turnovers. We had another person write in saying that the knowledge of knowing what players play better together in different situations is essential. Yes, 100% agree with that. Uh, we had someone else write in, Warriors fan here, Mike Brown totally deserves to be coach of the year. Love to see the camaraderie and then deservedly the best coach of 2023. Congratulations, Mike Brown and the Sacramento Kings. Great job to the team members. Love to see all the positivity. And we're still getting all of your Kings pictures. Keep them coming. Scan that QR code on your screen because we love to see things like this. Michael and his son, Michael has been a Kings fan for 29 years, and he agrees that Coach Mike Brown is helping to usher in a new dynasty. Mike Brown brought the team together. You know, um, it's like, they're, they're, they're playing as a unit. They're all in sync. And I believe Mike Brown has all to do with that. This means everything for the city. It means everything. Um, we've been overlooked. We've been stepped on. We've been talked about. Actually, we haven't been talked about enough because there was nothing to talk about. We're giving them something to talk about. Oh, yeah, no doubt about that. And Michael says that his son hasn't had to see all the bad and ugly days with the team, and he hopes that they'll just keep on seeing the good times roll. So keep those pictures and stories coming. We love to see it. Also, if you're heading out to San Francisco for the game, quick note here, cowbells will not be permitted into the stadium. So I'm not even going to comment on that. We'll go ahead and end the show. We'll see you tomorrow for game three. Have a great night.
Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916 321 3310.